Hi, everybody. Welcome and thank you so much for being here today. Um, we are so excited that you were able to make it to our CSU Spur series um, and talk about the Temple Grandin Equine Center as well as volunteering opportunities down in the center. Um, if you are logging in online uh, via StreamYard or through YouTube, uh, please just type in the comment section where you are where you graduated from as well as what year you graduated. Um, if you don't want to put it, that in there, it's challenged by choice, feel free to not put it in there as well. Um, but either way, we are so excited that you are here and thank you so, so much for making it today. Um, I also want to throw out another thank you for all of our alumni members that are logging in tonight. Uh, without your membership, we are not able to do events like this or other events in the area. So thank you so much for being a member. Thank you for showing your RAM pride. We are so excited that you are members. and. Like I said, we can't do these events without you. Um, in a minute, I will go ahead and post some information in the chat as well. So if you are ever interested about memberships, uh, you can click on the link and you can go see um, what our membership is as well as more information about the membership program. Um, also feel free because this is a uh, YouTube channel that this is getting streamed to. Check out our YouTube channel, subscribe to it. It's the CSU Alumni Association. I will also put that into the uh, chat in just a minute. Um, also, this is a series, so feel free to check out the series. We have all a, a bunch of other events that we've been doing with uh, the Spur Campus. Um, feel free to read and listen to all of the other information that has been coming out. Um, uh, a couple other things too, I'm going to post in the chat in a little bit, just other volunteer opportunities that we have. If you're ever interested in volunteering for the CSU Alumni Association, uh, once the Temple Grandin Equine Center opens down in Denver, we will work a little bit more with them on volunteer opportunities. Um, but we also have a volunteer coordinator. His name is Matt Flick. I will post his information in the chat as well so that you can connect with him and uh, talk a little bit more about volunteering. Uh, opportunities for you. Um, also, I will post in the chat my information. Uh, if you are having any technical difficulties, feel free to just email me or shoot me a text on my phone. Um, I will have it here with me at the entire time so that I can help uh, facilitate any problems that are going on. Um, and with that, I'm actually going to pass it over to uh, Debbie and Adrian to talk about the Temple Equine Center as well as some volunteering opportunities. Again, thank you so much for being here and go Rams. Go ahead, Debbie, take it away. Okay, well, thank you, Corey. And uh, thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. So we're very excited uh, to be able to share what we have down here at the Temple Grand and Equine Center in Denver. So we're at the Spur campus, of course, um, I'm sure everybody knows about what's going on here in Denver, but I just wanted to kind of let everyone know that we're here in a temporary location until then. We've actually been open since 2017 um, at National Western. We started down in the stockyards for a couple years, and then uh, two years ago, we moved up to a different facility um, because of all the renovations that are happen happening down there. And uh, so we're just off Brighton Boulevard next door to the post office now. So if you know where the Equine Center is, uh, we're just north of there and then on the east side of the street. So um, it does, um, we do have current volunteer opportunities, not just uh, when we open the center um, in January. So we're really uh, getting excited about that. But um, so we're here to talk today about volunteer opportunities and I'm really looking forward to be able to share these opportunities with you because I just think it's so much fun for people to come and do things like this, especially if they're retired or maybe needing hours for school. Um, it's just a really great way to give of yourself and then you get so much back as well. So um, we do, we welcome all ages um 14 and under we do ask if you know if you want to bring any family members we do ask that they be um, accompanied by a parent at all times they don't necessarily have to be standing right next to them but we do want them to stay on site with them um, of course all abilities we have all different sorts of of uh, uh, volunteer opportunities, different things you can do. So you don't necessarily even have to be able-bodied to be able to, 
to participate in our volunteer program. So um, we do give volunteer orientations and we do teach a little bit of how we handle our horses and what we do uh, within the session. So um, don't worry if you don't have any horse experience, that's okay. Um, all of our horses are trained really well and we want to be able to train you um, of how we handle them because we might handle them just a little bit differently than how you handle your own horses in your own backyard. Um, it can take up to three people to provide one therapy session. So that's why we ask for, you know, a horse leader, a sidewalker or two, um, cause it can include the therapist or not. Um, I always need help in the office. So that's always welcome as well. Um, of course, we always have general housekeeping duties that we need to do. Hopefully when we get in the new Spur campus, we won't have to do too much of that ourselves, but for right now we are having to do that. Um, and then of course, feeding and cleaning the horses and, um, and handyman repairs. So we're, we just, we need help on all aspects. So even if you don't wanna handle the horses, there's other things, um, or if you know, you're shy with working with kids, there's other things definitely that we could um, ask your help with. So um, what I thought that I would start uh, with right off the bat was just a short little video that kind of explains what we do. Um, and then on the other side of the video, I'm going to kind of explain to you how you can get involved and how um, to paid in this session with these folks. So I want to go ahead and start that for you. Very good. Want to go again? Ready to go again? My son Maxwell was diagnosed with a rare neurological disease called SLC681. Okay, Mom, come on down, Miss Christy. Equine assisted occupational therapy has been the biggest improvement for Maxwell. Okay, you ready to go? He's just been so much happier, and we noticed soon after he started that. The equine therapy was really helping him build core strength that we otherwise couldn't do for him, but also really improving his behavioral outlook in the day to day. Here we go. <laughs> Yay, we got a five. Yay. Maxwell, today we were doing so much touching, seeking, tactile input. What does this feel like? You know, when he would touch the horse's coat and just brighten up. So uh, that's a big part of it. As a parent, it has been so much fun to watch Maxwell bond with the horse and be able to pet the horse and love on the horse. So the movement of the horse is really the key, one of the biggest keys to this kind of therapy. And just staying moving basically challenges our dynamic sitting balance, our uh, vestibular system moving through space, our proprioceptive system of telling where our body is in space. A lot of times it's the movement that is the magic. We would just notice he was so much happier and eating was easier and his natural walking gait had a more rhythmic movement to it that actually mimicked the horse and that's how he was learning to walk. You know, to me it seems like he's really enjoying that tactile sense, that touching of the coat. You know, he's really loving that, engaged. They've made such a difference in my little boy's life, and I'm just so thankful and grateful for everything this therapy is doing to help kids like Maxwell. Okay, let's walk on to Stacy. Yay! He's holding on both hands now. Hi, you're doing good. So I'm, I was really happy to show you that because what I want to do now is kind of explain to you what we do and why we do it. And I think you'll probably not look at horseback riding um, the same way ever again. So, or therapy, because um, we've kind of mixed the two and um, we've just, just, you know, made it something really special. So um, as Jeff was talking about, um, you know, occupational therapy on horseback, um, it really helps to increase, you know, their sensory, um, you know, think about kiddos who, who go to a clinic that has four walls 
and that's all they do is get on machines or they do the same movement over and over again and you know therapy gets to be mundane and so um what we look forward to here is to be able to have them enjoy coming to therapy and um, to be able to interact with them and really um, have fun with them while they're building you know their core strength their balance their endurance their sensory their coordination so um, i just kind of want to give you a little bit more information of you know what you'll be doing within the session to be able to help these kiddos um, while while they're in therapy so um, it's not just a pony ride well, you know like i said you're never going to look at it the same way again because i'm going to be able to explain to you why why the horse moves the same as a man moves and so we're going to get into that here in a minute but um, it's definitely not just sitting on a horse and, and being taken around the arena, just in circles. So um, from the time we're born, we go through a developmental sequence. And so, you know, we're born and we lay on our back and then we roll over and we push up into hands and knees and then we crawl and then we go on to tall kneeling and then half kneeling like the proposal pose and then standing and then walking. So we can do all of these positions on the horse. And so as a volunteer, we need you to help us keep that client safe. And of course, we're not going to do standing on the horse with someone on a 17 hand horse that's, you know, six and a half foot tall, you know, that the person is six and a half foot tall. But we might do it on a pony with a very small child with a, you know, three or four year old child. Um, you can see this little boy, I think he's probably about nine years old. We have him on hands and knees and he's actually facing backwards on the horse. Um, and we can put him, you know, like I say, forwards, backwards, side sitting. Um, and each time we change the positions for them, uh, we're dipping, we're using a different muscle group. And so, um, you know, we're also working the vestibular system. So your ears. Uh, your visual system. So we're going to challenge all of the systems that it takes in order to, you know, move throughout your daily life and to be able to eventually walk. So um, we will definitely train you on how to keep these kiddos safe. A lot of them will wear a gate belt um, that has handles on them so that we can, you know, definitely keep a hand on them as well. But we are going to get them in all sorts of different positions. So again, it's not your normal your normal pony ride. So um, as we move from the developmental sequence, we go from standing into walking. The reason that we like to use the horse is because the horse has a very similar pattern to when walking as a human does. So um, the human pelvis and the horse pelvis moves exactly the same. And so this picture, if you stand behind a horse and a human when they're walking, then you can see that pelvis move, you know, front to back. You can see the lateral side to side movement. You can see the so they can shift their weight. Um, you can see the vertical movement to be able to clear your toe, um, the rotational, so your hip actually rotates, and then your movement through space. So anybody that says it's a three-dimensional movement and they need to add two more dimensions to it. So because we've got a couple more, it's actually five dimensional movement. But that's why we use the horse. So along with, you know, all of the things that, you know, it's great bonding with the horse and the, and the warmth of the horse's body as well will help people to stretch out when they're straddling the horse. And um, so it just kind of helps with, um, you know, teaching a normal gait pattern. So if you've ever walked alongside your horse, if you have horses, you've noticed they walk the same miles per hour as we do. They take the same average steps per minute and they take the same average step length. And of course, this is, um, you know, very relative of, you know, a small person and a small horse or a large person and a large horse, right? For your step length and your steps per minute and your miles per hour, but relatively speaking, it's all very, very similar. So again, that's why we wanna use the horse. 
So again, just a little bit more background for, for you all for, for what we're doing and why. Um, we want to give normal neurological input to these people. So it's all very scientific. Um, you know, I'm a physical therapist assistant by trade. I'm also a certified therapeutic driving instructor through PATH. But um, so, you know, we're doing this for many, many different reasons. So your visual system is your very first um, defense in your balance. And so if we put someone on a horse and ask them to close their eyes, you know, we're really challenging their balance just by taking away that vision. Um, your vestibular system, so by putting them sitting sideways on the horse, you know, people don't walk sideways, we don't walk like crabs, and so we can work on that vestibular system to be able to integrate for, for movement, because sometimes you do need to step to the side to go around someone um, or to avoid an obstacle or, or something like that. Um, your proprioception, you know, Jeff talked about that a little bit in the um, video. So what proprioception is, is it's actually within your joints and it tells your body where you are in space. And so it tells your muscles how much they need to fire to be able to keep your balance. And so we can do that, you know, by again, changing positions on the horse. And so again, that's where you come in is to help us change positions um, to keep them safe. And the therapists are going to guide you through, you know, your hand placement, um, you know, and how you can work to help to keep that person safe and help them to get into the correct position. So, um, again, all the sensory. So it's so great to be in a barn and not in an office building where it's the same smell day after day and the same sights day after day. You know, in a barn, we've got, you know, the different sounds of the horses. We've got the different smells of the horses that aren't, you know, within our homes or our office buildings. Um, the tactile, which is just, you know, what Jeff was also talking about, um, especially if uh, people don't have pets within their homes. You know, maybe a horse is the only animal that they're connecting with at the time. So, you know, we can definitely work with that. Um, we can also, we do finger painting on the horse. Um, you know, we do all sorts of sensory. We play with uh, catch with balls. We also have balls that have like little pokey things on them. So anybody who's tactilely defensive, um, we can get them, you know, to, to be encouraged to play with something and touch something maybe a little bit different. Um, something that's really slimy, some people are really tactilely defensive over. Um, so maybe, you know, smells too. So all different things you know, within the barn that's not normally found within the home or the office. And then cognition. So we can definitely set, um, you know, something sequentially. So you have to do this before you do this, before you do the next thing, right? And then motor planning and motor learning is more about, you know, your body and, you um, Motor planning is actually, you know, knowing how hard to grab something to be able to pick it up. Like if I want to pick up this water bottle, I need to know how hard do I need to squeeze it to pick it up. So maybe I don't hold it tight enough or maybe I hold it too tight and squeeze it. So that's motor planning. And then motor learning is just is repetition. And so that's where the horse comes in because it's the same rhythmical slow movement that's just almost on the beat of a drum that um, we can continue to use to be able to um, teach them their, their motor learning. So I like this picture because, you know, when you think about horseback riders, you don't necessarily think about people who are in wheelchairs. And so we can use the horse and um, what we do with the horse to be able to help people with transferring skills. And so we have a definite system of things to do while, um, you know, we're transferring from the wheelchair on the mounting block onto the horse. And so a lot of people who are in a wheelchair can at least do a standing pivot transfer and so we can help them to stand and then we will rotate them onto sitting sideways on the horse 
and then we'll take one leg and put it up over the neck of the horse and then we can go ahead and walk forward into the arena from the mounting block and then we can work on the core stability and help them to be able to strengthen their core so that they can help and be able to assist with their transfers um, because you know they don't literally spend their entire lives in their wheelchair they have to transfer to the bed they transfer to the toilet maybe they stand up and cook uh, maybe they need to stand up to reach something from the top shelf just momentarily and then be able to sit back down so that's why um, this works so well with people in wheelchairs and also think about you know how empowering it is for someone that's been in a wheelchair for so long that hasn't been able to do something independently. Now we put them on the horse and all they need to do is shift their weight or maybe just turn left or right or just turn their eyes or their head and suddenly they're in control and being able to move the horse where they want to go without having to ask someone else for help. So it's very empowering. It's very, very, um, very fun to watch, to watch these people grow. So that's kind of all on the therapy side. So that was, I, I talked more about, you know, physical and occupational therapy. Um, so physical therapy, we're, we're working more on the larger muscle groups. And so, you know, your, your core, your legs, your balance, your strength, your coordination, and then occupational therapy, we're working more on fine motor skills. And so writing, drawing, maybe some hand-eye coordination, some cognition, some sensory. But everything that we do in therapy, it has to start at the base. It has to start at the core, and then it can move. So you go distal to pro or, I'm sorry, proximal to distal. And but you because you can't write if you can't support yourself. So a lot of the therapy kind of crosses over. Um, so now we move into therapeutic or adaptive writing. And um, people who participate in the therapeutic or adaptive writing um, also have some sort of disability. Um, and so they are also benefiting from the movement of the horse because with PT and OT, we're not necessarily teaching them horsemanship skills. Um, we're just using the movement of the horse as a tool. But um, in therapeutic or adaptive riding, we are going to teach them horsemanship skills. And so this is, again, where you could really be interactive as a volunteer to assist them in, you know, in helping to learn how to groom and lead and tack and ride. And so, you know, because they don't all obviously start off independent. So that's, of course, a goal that we work towards, but it's not necessarily where, where everybody can start. Um, also within our program, we offer uh, equine assisted psychotherapy, which we don't really have um, a need for volunteers there um, because they're very private sessions. But I just wanted to kind of let you know what goes on within those sessions, because to me, it's just very exciting and um, interesting. And so within um, equine assisted psychotherapy, you know, it, it helps to really learn body language. Um, you know, nonverbal communication, physical boundaries. I mean, I think this is a perfect picture where it shows, you know, this lady standing in this herd of horses and, you know, you see one is kind of aloof. He really doesn't care what she's got, but everybody else is kind of interested. And so um, this will be able to teach her her own physical boundaries. And so maybe she is in an abusive situation at home or at school and maybe she needs to learn to say, it's not okay that you come inside my bubble. And so this is where she can learn to be able to, you know, push a 1200 pound horse away and say, this is my space and that's your space. And it's okay if I say that. It's okay if I'm my own self advocate and say, it's not okay that you come into my own, into my space. Um, you know, we have, it's a lot of uh, motivation and so, you know, people, of course, are going to do things that they, they want to do um, rather than what they have to do. And so working with horses, I mean, horses give unconditional love, right? And you can read their body language just the same as they're reading yours. And so if we can teach them to watch what the horse is doing 
the expressions on his face, his body language, is he moving towards you? Is he moving away from you? Is he looking at you? Is he looking away? Um, you know, is he yawning, showing signs of stress? And so that will help them to take that into their everyday lives to be able to read human nonverbal behavior and then also be able to kind of look into themselves and, you know, what kind of behavior and nonverbal communication are they giving off? So, so just kind of a little brief, you know, explanation of, of what that is. Like I say, those are really private sessions. Um, they do individual and group sessions, um, but again, they're, they're, they're very private. So within our new facility, um, we will have a very large arena and we'll be able, we'll have drop down curtains so that we can actually quarter the arena. So if we do have an equine assisted psychotherapy session going, we can actually make that private so that no one else can see or hear what's going on there. And, but we will be able to see what's going on in other parts of the arena. So, so something to, to look forward to in that facility. So we work with kids from 18 months to 99 years old. Um, the therapeutic riding usually starts after age four, uh, but we do PT and OT starting at 18 months, and then we can work all the way through to 99 years old. So any kind of ability, or if you want to call it a disability, um, you know, we work with, with everyone. So it's, it's more towards the neurological um, spectrum rather than orthopedic. So we don't see a lot of um, knee replacements, hip replacements, shoulder replacements, things like that. Um, however, we do see, you know, some spinal cord injuries, um, some traumatic brain injuries, those kind of things. So, um, you know, just to kind of give you a little bit of the spectrum of, of who we work with. Um, the video that I showed you, that little boy has, you know, uh, a chromosomal um, anomaly is really what it is because there's not very many people in the world that has um, the condition that he has. And we actually serve several people who have chromosomal um, anomalies. And so um, everyone kind of presents just a little bit differently, um, but that's what makes everything really interesting. So um, when you volunteer, um, we kind of ask that you come you know, on a regular basis because we um, consistently have like, you know, just for an example, little Johnny comes every Monday at nine o'clock. And so for consistency um, concerns for Johnny, for him socially, it's actually easier for him to be able to learn one person rather than to learn a new person every single week. And so the therapist is always consistent, right? But we do ask that then the, the volunteers are consistent as well. And that's kind of a benefit to you too, because then you get to learn the, the, the kiddos, their families, the horses, um, you know, it's just, it's kind of beneficial to all. So um, the reason we need volunteers is because safety, safety, safety. So I talked about standing on the horse. So here's the perfect example. Um, of standing on the horse. And so you can see volunteers need to be very attentive to everything that's going on. Uh, we actually do have the, the horse go ahead and walk while the child is on there. Um, the reason that we do that is because, you know, a child's job is to play, right? And so we want to be able to get them as functionally normal as possible. And so maybe this little girl wanted to learn how to skateboard or maybe she just wanted to ride the escalator at the department store, um, or maybe she wanted to learn to ski. So that's how it could be transferred into doing a functional activity. And, you know, like I said, this is probably a pretty tall horse that we, we did this on, um, but she's such a little, little thing that she was easy to, to manage and to handle. And, you know, she had pretty great balance to start with. So, um, but we do emphasize safety, safety, safety. So we have so many volunteers that come. I just kind of wanted to, um, you know, introduce you to a couple of them, um, Carol, and then the, the married couple that's on the next screen. Um, they both come three and four times a week and help out. And you know, um, 
two out of the three of them were not originally uh, people who had had any horse experience and they just enjoy it so much now. And of course, working with the kids and um, we have a lot of retired teachers and retired therapists and, um, you know, again, students that need volunteer hours. But, you know, I, I guarantee you, once you start coming, you're going to get hooked because you will just go home so happy to be able to be a part of this. You know, I've, I've been doing this for 12 years now, and I have said every single day, I love my job. You know, just there's nothing better about working with kids and horses. And, you know, we do work with adults as well. Um, but here, the great thing is the adults want to be here. You know, they're not coming to therapy here um, out of obligation. They're coming here because they've actually chosen to. So that's kind of a neat, a neat thing. So. Um, I'll move to the next screen so you can meet um, Fred and Diane. And um, like I said, Fred has been one of our, our consistent volunteers that has come out to help us with a lot of our handyman work. Um, Diane didn't know horses at all. She was terrified of horses, but just had the determination to learn. And now, you know, like I say, she comes out three and four times a week. She loves Adol just, you know, that's her favorite horse. They have really bonded and um, it's really enjoyable to watch. You know, it, it just, it, it warms my heart for her as well. So, because I think this is actually very therapeutic for her. I think she was probably, when she was home, she was maybe a little sedentary and not having a whole lot of, um, you know, physical activity. And so this has really gotten her out and gotten her active and I mean, just to see the difference in how she's changed since she's been here. I just, I think she's a lot happier now and um, just has really enjoyed her time here. And we really enjoyed having her too. Um, so here's my email address. And so you guys can contact me directly or on the next screen, I'll have um, also the Temple Grand and Equine Center email address that you can you know, email either one, it will come to me both ways. But we do have an orientation process. And so the first time that you come, you'll fill out all of your waivers of liability, you know, all of your emergency contact information, all of your paperwork. Um, and then I will give you, you know, again, which now you already know, so you're not gonna know, need to know the introduction to the uh, Temple Grandin Equine Center, but there might be some other people that maybe have seen us on Volunteer Match or Idealist or uh, some of the other um, uh, programs that were listed on. But so I kind of give a little bit of a background and give the description of services, things that you might be doing while you're here. Um, facility updates. So like what I told you, you know, we're in our um, temporary facility here right now. And then we're looking forward to stock show being over in the new Vita building um, at the Spur campus. So, and doing some demonstrations throughout stock show, keep your fingers crossed. We're hoping that that happens. Um, and then we are planning on resuming our um, full programming February 1st. So we're going to close down this facility at Christmas. So December 20th will be our last day of uh, programming in this building, but we'll be here every day until then. Um, and then we'll move over to the new facility, uh, if, you know, January and then start regular programming again, uh, February 1st. We are expected to see anywhere between 125 to 300 people a week. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of the scope of things, right now we're seeing between 30 and 40. So we're really gonna have to wrap it up. Um, right now we have a herd of six horses and we will be increasing our herd to 13. So if you all know of any horses that might be appropriate, we are looking for horses. You can let me know um, through my email address about that as well. Um, and then again, during your volunteer orientation, we will, you know, give you a tour of, of this current facility. We'll give you a demonstration, you know, briefly of what we do, um, hands-on, you know, grooming, um, tacking, you know, how do you put on and off a, a halter? You know, some people who want to come and volunteer, you may not even know how to do that. So we start at the basics and then we work up from there. 
Um, if you're not comfortable with leading the horse, we can always um, uh, use you as a side walker or again, you know, doing the other other skills that I that I told about earlier on. Um, and then we do kind of practice a little bit, a mock session. And so I have everybody rotate into different positions, side walkers, leaders, um, expect during one session to walk up to one mile in the dirt. So it is a good workout. Um, you feel very good when you go home, you feel like you didn't have to go to the gym that day. Um, and then we use a, a volunteer scheduler program um, it's online. And so you can go on to that service and you can pick and choose what days and what shifts that you want to come volunteer. So, um, you, you know, it's, it's actually very autonomous. You can, um, really, really, really choose your own schedule. So, um, again, like I said, it's optimal that you come on a regular consistent basis, but it's not required. So, so thank you so much. That's the end of my presentation. Um, again, you can email me or the Temple Grand and Equine Center at colostate.edu. Um, but thank you very much for, for listening to me um, go on and on and on. I appreciate it. I am, I'm very passionate about it and it's very fun. I enjoy it and I would look forward to meeting you all. Awesome. Now we're going to go ahead and pop over to Adrian. Um, also, I just would like to uh, reiterate too, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the comment section um, and we will address them as we're going on in the presentation or right at the end as well. So um, up next, let's have Adrian Kimana. Take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Adrienne Sedlak. I am the new education manager for the CSU Spur campus. Uh, I just started a little less than a month ago, so I'm still getting my feet under me and figuring out the ropes, but really excited to be a part of this amazing journey and this amazing facility. Um, Corey, thank you for um, allowing me to be here tonight to kind of follow up um, it's hard to follow up after Debbie. Debbie, your passion and your work is just so incredible. That was amazing to watch and to hear and to learn. Cannot wait to work with you and, um, and see you in action. Um, so as Debbie was sharing about volunteer opportunities within Temple Grandin, um, the Equine Center, I also wanted to pop in and share just a little bit about um, a couple of updates regarding SPUR in general, and then uh, share just a little bit about what we're envisioning for the volunteer program. Um, this is very much a building the plane while you fly at moment. So while we are envisioning how we're using volunteers, we're very much building the, uh, the system and uh, the process um, and really looking for input as well and working with our partners to make sure we are utilizing volunteer volunteers in a way that's meaningful and um, and that those who choose to volunteer with SPUR are really able to feel like they're giving back to their community, uh, have a fun and engaging experience, and ultimately also really an opportunity to network and engage and learn from each other and all the amazing scientists and experts that are going to be housed at the SPUR campus. Uh, so before I dive into the volunteers, I just want to, you know, I know many of you have heard about SPUR and you've heard from my colleague Catherine about the educational programs. Just for those of you who might be new, um, just a very brief overview here. Again, just this amazing connection between CSU and the National Western Center, really envisioning CSU SPUR as a hub of learning, uh, not only for CSU, really showcasing all the amazing research and uh, science that's happening on uh, the campuses across the state and and through CSU Global, but also um, that partnership with the National Western Center and um, acting as a hub of learning for their facility and their site as well. Really leveraging the amazing 16 days of the stock show and really hoping that we can turn the facility and the site into a year long learning facility. Uh, just again, that intersection, really recognizing that at SPUR, we're hoping to engage and have this really amazing connection between education, research, and outreach, uh, really engaging the higher education community, of course, through CSU's K-12 through and pre-K-12 through school systems, community members, um, and then, of course, industry partners and the experts in the field doing all the amazing research. 
And of course, we wouldn't be here without all of our amazing partners from the Dumb Friends League, Temper, Temple Grand and Equine Center, History Colorado, Denver Museum of Nature and Science, all just amazing thought partners and helping Spur come to life and also helping us uh, envision and craft what a volunteer program and what role, uh, what roles volunteers can play on site. Um, so again, if you haven't seen this beautiful overview of what the campus will look like in the future, this is um, just an incredible um, long-term vision here. Um, I encourage all of you, if you've not had a chance to see Spur growing, we are offering tours. So please check out our website to uh, sign up for a free public tour. Um, but the Spur buildings are down in the lower um, section of the screen here. We have our Vita building, Hydro and Terra. So that just this amazing campus where this uh, convergence of learning and uh, science and action will all be coming together. And again, all part of that amazing uh, National Western Center and their complex and their facilities being built as well. Uh, so then we have, I'm sure many of you are familiar with our three different buildings, but really leveraging each of their uh, core content and bringing in key partners to help us uh, share their expertise and, um, you know, really highlight all the amazing uh, action that's happening through their great work. Um, so for example, in the hydro building where we have a partnership with Denver Water, they're gonna have a facility um, on site. Um, the Terra building uh, is gonna be really focused around controlled agriculture and have a commissary kitchen. The Vita building is going to house the Temple Grand and Equine Center, uh, as well as a um, facility for the, Dumb, uh, the Denver Dumb Friends League. Uh, so just really excited to work with these amazing partners to bring these this facility and this campus to life. Uh, just an update on the timeline. It's amazing. Construction of three major buildings is on time. We're really excited. So the Vita building will be opening in January, as Debbie mentioned. Um, and then our Terra not long after in early 2022. And then the Hydro building will be opening by November uh, of next year. Um, so feel free, as Corey was sharing, if you have any questions about SPUR in general, you are welcome to enter them into the comments. But I wanted to just spend a minute or two and just share what we're thinking on a very high level with our volunteer program. Again, we're very much building this. And of course, if anybody's interested or has any feedback or thoughts, I'm very open to um, open to that type of communication and hearing about um, what's worked for you or thoughts that you may have around the best way to engage volunteers. But really a lot of our work is going to be leveraging all the amazing on-site research and uh, experiences that our partners are providing and then providing educational experiences around that. So CSU Spur volunteers uh, might not be directly engaging with the horses, the Temple Grand and Equine Center, but we will have volunteers that we hope will be on the other side of the glass providing interpretation and sharing about the experience. So when a visitor comes to our facility and sees the amazing work that Debbie's doing and, uh, and the volunteers through Temple Grandin, uh, that we have educators and volunteers on our end that can share about that with the public and make sure that um, that story is being told. So truly, we are envisioning a lot of really amazing ways that uh, our volunteers can engage the public um, through roles like uh, being a greeter, welcoming folks to our site, providing an orientation. Typically what you see at a main welcome desk at a lot of um, cultural institutions. Um, also providing exhibit interpretation, school program support. Uh, we are going to have a virtual reality classroom. So we are looking for volunteers who aren't afraid of technology, who might be excited to learn a new skill and learn a new tool to help educate um, children and multi-generational -gener audiences on um, anatomy and using uh, VR headsets to really help folks uh, get hands-on with, uh, with different uh, concepts. Uh, we are also looking for um, individuals to be tour guides. Right now we have a lot of interest from the public and our partners to hear and see the site in person. So um, just looking for individuals who can help us uh, share about the journey as Spur grows. Uh, we are also building out citizen science opportunities. So really, again, leveraging all the amazing research that's happening on site with um, with um, faculty and scientists and really um, bringing the public into that experience. 
There will also be special event opportunities. We know not everybody can be a regular volunteer, or commit to a weekly or monthly volunteer experience. So we will have episodic opportunities as well. Uh, and then again, just some of those, we're really looking to build out experiences where you as a volunteer can work directly with scientists. And then as I mentioned before, we're really still building out all the different possibilities that we can, um, how we can engage volunteers. Uh, but just to share um, a little bit more in depth, I know many of you may have seen some of these renderings before, but just to show you how, you know, we'd like to visualize using volunteers and partnering with volunteers is really thinking about, especially in our Vita space, which is opening in January, really our first big need um, is really thinking about, again, how are we welcoming visitors? Can we have a volunteer providing an orientation uh, as people pop into the building for a drop-in experience? Or when we have a school group show up, provide a brief orientation and make sure the teachers are oriented and know where to start their programs. Uh, we also in the Vita building will have a mock veterinary lab where children and multi-generational audiences can get to experience what it's like to uh, take care of an animal or uh, be a veterinarian or a vet tech. Uh, so uh, we envision using volunteers in this space to directly engage children and to be able to show them how to use a tool, how to take an x-ray, um, how to really activate and leverage this space and turn it into a um, a dramatic play or a, a very much hands-on learning experience for our visitors. Uh, in our partnership with the Denver Dumb Friends League, they are going to have on show an on-show veterinary clinic where we will have um, the technology to be able to have a live interaction with a, a veterinarian or a vet tech um, performing a surgery live where we envision having somebody on the other side of the glass who can do interpretation, who can share about what's happening, provide a little bit of guidance, and then also directly facilitate that conversation with the, um, the vet team in the, in the surgery room. So uh, we'll definitely have education staff trained to facilitate these conversations, but we're also looking for passionate and interested volunteers who are who wouldn't mind um, sharing about the process with our public and with visitors. Um, and then also, like I mentioned in our VR classroom, again, just excited to be able to use this new technology, this real world technology that many uh, medical and veterinary institutes are using to train their uh, future uh, doctors and future veterinarians on anatomy, we're excited to be able to use VR and be able to expose children and, uh, and families and adults to this technology to be able to learn and get hands-on as well. And again, looking for volunteers to help facilitate some of those experiences. And then we just heard such wonderful volunteer opportunities with Debbie and Temple Grandin, but also want to recognize in this little room up here, it's actually not little, it's very big. We have this wonderful on-show experience where the where, um, visitors to CSU Spur will be able to see what Debbie was describing and be able to connect and to see and to learn um, how horses have such a positive and amazing benefit for uh for children and for adults. Uh, but we want to make sure we are sharing that right story. So we want, we're looking for volunteers who not only um, might be a great Temple Grandin volunteer, but also might want to step on our side of the glass and be able to interpret and to be able to share about what's going on. Uh, so be able to really share the story of the volunteers, of those who are directly working with the children and uh, families utilizing the facility. Uh, same can be said, there's also going to be an equine sports medicine facility that will also be on show. So again, kind of thinking about utilizing volunteers to be able to be those storytellers for SPUR, to be able to bring those um, those experiences that, the, uh, that visitors can see to life and be able to connect the visitors to those experiences. So again, looking for volunteers to help tell that story. Uh, in the Terra building, which is our second building to open. Um, and I guess to clarify, in all of our buildings, we're going to have really wonderful hands-on exhibits. So even beyond the storytelling experience of volu that volunteers can participate in, we're also looking for volunteers who wouldn't mind just being in the exhibit area to share and interact with the public, to help the public um, engage with a digital display um, or uh, in provide some hands-on materials to a wall um, 
exhibit space. And then in the Terra building, the teaching kitchen, providing um, opportunities to volunteer potentially with a nutrition class or even participate in uh, food testing opportunities. And then in Terra, we're going to have a roof, rooftop greenhouse and a green space. So thinking about even having opportunities for gardening um, or partnering with the controlled agriculture folks that we're going to be partnering with to uh, to maintain those spaces. And then I'm personally very excited about um, probably the last phase of our development and growth is this beautiful backyard space that's being um, built in connection to the hydro building. We're really envisioning this backyard space connecting to the Platte River and being able to, again, use this as an amazing space for citizen science, uh, water quality testing with the Platte River. Um, again, just amazing opportunities to think about how we can uh, even uh, have nature play or guided experiences outdoors that volunteers can help facilitate. So just, uh, you know, so many amazing possibilities with these spaces and these wonderful buildings and all the amazing partners that we're working with to bring in volunteers to share the story of the facilities and the partners. Um, I'm sure many of you are following us, but please, if you're not following us on social media, check us out, follow our journey, follow our growth, literally, as we are building our site. Uh, and then last but not least, um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but just wanted to also share my contact information. Um, as I mentioned, we are still building the program. Uh, so if you notice on the SPUR website, we do not have a volunteer page yet, but it is coming. And once it is built, I will be sure to share that with Corey. And now, uh, Matt, I will make sure to reach out with to Matt, the alumni volunteer co coordinator as well, and make sure he gets that information. Um, but otherwise, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for allowing me to share just some of our high-level vision. And we hope to see all of you at SPUR. Awesome. I'm going to go ahead and put you both back up here. And then um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, so first question, and feel free to uh, write more questions as we're asking questions. Uh, we have about eight minutes left with the presentation. If we go over, do not worry, this is being recorded, so you can always pop back on YouTube later or StreamYard and check out the presentation and hear the rest of the questions. Um, so first question, um, Debbie, I believe this one was more um, to you, was can you say where the temp facility is located again? Uh, and also you're muted right now. There we go. I found it. Okay. Sorry. Um, so we're at 4980 Brighton Boulevard. And so we're right off of Brighton, just, just north of I-70. So if you guys know where the event center is at National Western, we're just north and east of there, just next door to the post office. Awesome. And then uh, the next question um, I think would be great for both of you is how many hours per week are required to volunteer when volunteering for each uh, area? Um, so with us, we usually ask for two to three hours if you're, just, if you're coming for one session. So, you know, but make it worth your while. Um, we do one hour sessions once a week with the kids. So we usually ask that volunteers come in about 30 minutes early. So say the, the session starts at 9 o'clock. We ask you to be here at 8.30. And then you're usually done by 10, 10, 15. So just to make it worth your while for the drive and everything, go ahead and sign up for two sessions. And then uh, you would probably be done before noon. Great. Um, I feel, Adrian, you want to talk on yours too? Yes, sure. We are still envisioning that. I would say right now we're looking at not necessarily a weekly commitment, but more of a monthly time frame. Um, and I think most of our roles really, it makes a lot of sense for folks to be on site for three to four hour shifts. So I think we're looking at uh, four to eight hour commitments a month. But at the same time, we're also very flexible. If we have a volunteer that can commit to two hours a month and regularly, we are going to work with you. We'll we want you there yeah yeah same here and we do also have you know one time or you know special events so like stock show we always host a booth at pony trails and so we need a lot of help there because that's a lot of hours 16 days straight 
covering, you know, from nine o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock at night, we need a lot of volunteers. So, um, you know, just again, just contact me and, you know, we're going to need help moving. So over the Christmas break, if anybody wants to help do that. Um, and then we'll also need help uh, during the stock show. They're offering or they're, they're wanting to offer um, demonstrations before some of the, the, the big shows like the Grand Prix and, you know, um, dances with horses and, and things like that. So um, if that all works out, then I'll need uh, some volunteers for that as well. Perfect. Uh, this next question I think is more for Debbie is, um, is there also a Fort Collins facility for this program, which I believe is more about the Temple Grandin Equine Center in Fort Collins? Yes, yeah, so we do have the two locations. In fact, uh, we just opened that new building uh, February 1st of this year. So yes, there is one. And if you uh, email the Temple Grandin Equine Center at colostate.edu, then uh, that email also goes to Adam Dario, who's our executive director, and then he can uh, send you to someone uh, if you're interested in volunteer opportunities up there. Perfect. Yeah. Um, the next one is for both of you. Um, what guidelines are you both implementing for volunteers to follow with regards to COVID? Um, Adrian, you want to go first or you want me to go first? <laughs> Um, I would say we haven't fully flushed out those details yet, but I do know we're following what uh, CSU guidelines very closely. So we're f definitely following university recommendations and requirements. Yeah, same here. So um, if we've been told that if we're in our office space by ourselves, then we don't have to have our masks on. Um, if we are in the indoor, um, you know, admin part, then we do have masks on. Once we're out in the barn, if we're able to open, we have three large garage doors, so we get really good ventilation. And then we also have ceiling fans running, you know, just about 24 uh, seven. So we have really good ventilation in here. Um, we do uh, follow our family's requests if they, you know, want everybody to be masked when they're, you know, close to their family member, then we will do so. Um, you know, outside, I don't think that they're requiring masks so and our and the barn is actually considered outside because of all the ventilation that we have awesome um and then the last question that i have right now unless another one comes in is what are the hours of the day that the equine therapy is offered so right now we're monday through friday pretty much nine to five uh, when we move into our new facility in february uh, we'll extend those hours. We'll probably go till seven o'clock in the evenings, and then we will also include Saturdays. Awesome. Uh, well, on that, um, it looks like I don't have any more questions. So, again, thank you so much, everybody, for making it. Um, again, if you want to rewatch this video, it will be on YouTube. Um, so do not hesitate to look at the CSU Alumni Association on YouTube. You can also check out all of the other uh, Spur series that we've talked about uh, throughout the year. Um, and with that, I will let everybody go. And thanks so much for being here. And go Rams. Go Rams. Thank you so much. Thank you, Corey.